Hello and welcome to Safety Tavern's video on rigging. Let's get into a video. Our first video comes to us from Liftall. Liftall, the world's largest manufacturer of slings for the material handling industry, presents Safety in Lifting. This presentation is designed to make you more familiar with the wide range of material handling slings available to help you lighten the load and to highlight procedures that can improve safety awareness for sling applications. In short, to provide life-saving knowledge for field personnel. Slings can be divided into two basic categories, those made from synthetic materials and those made from steel. Synthetic slings are often used where protecting the load is a major concern. They are lightweight and easy to use, making them the first choice for many applications. Two types of synthetic slings are web slings and round slings. For web slings, several types of webbing are available to accommodate the varied needs of web sling users. Most sling webbing has interior yarns that offer reserve strength in case surface yarns have been damaged. Polyester and nylon are the two most common fibers used to make sling webbing. Nylon will stretch approximately 10% and polyester will stretch approximately 7% at rated capacity, both helping to dampen the effects of dynamic loading. If used in a chemical environment, contact the manufacturer for recommendations. Standard sling webbing is available in two strength ratings, 1,200 pounds per inch of width for standard duty, or 1,600 pounds per inch of width for heavy duty. 1,200 pound web is approximately 1 8th of an inch thick. 1,600 pound web is approximately 3 16ths of an inch thick. Sling webbing is available with edge protecting yarns to help reduce abrasion and cutting of the edge. Sling webbing is also available with abrasion resistant yarns covering all surfaces. Unlike web slings, all of the load-bearing fibers in most round slings are enclosed and protected by a two-ply independent cover. Round slings are made with either polyester or aramid core yarns. Aramid core slings have the lowest sling weight per capacity of all slings, making them especially useful for large capacity lifts. Industry standard colors for polyester round slings designate specific capacities. Steel slings are used for rugged loads or applications where elevated temperature, cutting, and or abrasion are a problem. They are typically used in conditions that could be abusive to synthetic slings. The three basic types of steel slings are chain, wire mesh, and wire rope. Wire rope slings are a standard in the construction industry. Made from high strength steel wire rope, they are available in many sizes, capacities, and configurations to meet a variety of lifting situations. The most commonly used rope is a 6x19 construction with an independent wire rope core. This rope offers good resistance to abrasion and flexibility sufficient for most applications. For greater flexibility, use ropes having a greater number of wires, such as a 6x37 class rope. Multi-part cabled or braided wire rope slings can offer an even greater degree of flexibility. For added flexibility and corrosion resistance, cable laid wire rope slings or multi-part slings made from galvanized or stainless steel wire rope make a great choice. Chain slings and attachments are made from alloy steel, engineered for strength and durability. They are used for the most rugged applications, including high temperature environments such as foundries and steel mills. Alloy steel chains are the only chains recommended for lifting purposes. Two grades of chain commonly used for slings are grade 80 and grade 100. Grade 80 is the industry standard and most widely used. Grade 100 is approximately 25% stronger for the same chain diameters, allowing a lighter sling to be used in certain situations. Wire mesh slings are made from high tensile steel wire, wound and fitted together to form a flexible, smooth, flat bearing surface. 
Mesh slings offer good cut resistance while protecting loads from damage and are commonly used with lifting beams to handle steel bars and bundled loads. Lift-all slings are manufactured to the highest standards and tested for reliability performance and user safety. As good as these products are, it's up to you to select the right sling for each job and to use safe lifting practices. If you don't, property damage, personal injury, or even death could result. There are many factors that must be taken into account when planning a safe lift. Failure to understand and apply the following practices may result in personal injury or death. The following guidelines meet OSHA and ASME B30.9 requirements. Never load slings in excess of their rated capacity. An important step in planning a safe lift is examining the load. You must consider the weight of the load, its structural stability, and center of gravity. If you do not already know the weight of the load, check for identification plates, shipping papers, manufacturer's catalogs, or contact the manufacturer. If you are unable to get a weight using these methods, you may have to estimate the load weight based on volume and standard material weights. Consult your supervisor if you are unfamiliar with these calculations. Another consideration involving the weight of the load is the center of gravity of the load. If only one crane hook is used to lift the load, it must be positioned over the load's center of gravity. Failure to do so will result in the load shifting and possible loss of load control. Whenever possible, fluids should be drained from the load to avoid shifting of the center of gravity during movement. Structural stability must be examined to avoid damage to or loss of the load. Some loads have designated pick points that are to be used for lifting purposes. If these are not available, be sure that the areas in contact with the sling will withstand the stress of the lift. Also remove or secure any loose parts. Check the sling tag for important information such as rated capacities, length, material, and manufacturer. Read the warnings on the sling tag and review the instruction sheet that accompanies a new sling for specific inspection and operating practices information. An essential step prior to selecting a sling is determining how the load will be rigged. You must take into account the type of hitch, vertical, choker, or basket, and the number of slings to be used. If lifting smooth cylinders or loose bundles, a double wrap choker or basket hitch may improve load control. This will give you 360 degree sling contact with the load and help prevent the load from slipping out. When using slings at any angle other than 90 degrees from horizontal, the tension on the slings increases. To illustrate, we have installed dynamometers in line with the slings being used to lift this load. The total weight being lifted in this example is 1,000 pounds. At exactly 90 degrees, the tension on each of the two legs would be 500 pounds. As the angle is decreased, the tension on the slings increases. What was 500 pounds at 90 degrees becomes 578 pounds as the angle reaches 60 degrees. 707 pounds as the angle reaches 45 degrees. And 1,000 pounds on each sling when the angle becomes 30 degrees. In essence, our 1,000 pound load weight, as seen by these slings, has doubled with this decreasing angle. For this reason, particular attention must be paid to sling capacities and load weights when using slings at angles of less than 90 degrees. Slings should not be used at angles of less than 30 degrees. Charts are available from Liftall for calculating this critical effect of angle on slings capacity. When in doubt, use the sling at only half of its rated capacity for the hitch being used. When multiple slings or sling legs are used, the legs may not be loaded equally. A qualified person should review the lift to avoid the overloading of any leg. 
After examining the load and determining the sling's braided capacity, you must inspect the area where the lift will be done. It is important that you identify the conditions and hazards of the work area and how they will be handled. Also be aware of how much headroom you have to lift the load. Check your hook travel and make sure you have a clear path. Locate electrical power lines, steam pipes, sprinkler lines, overhead conveyors, and air lines. If necessary, measure the ceiling clearances and doorways. Know in advance what lies in your lifting path. Look for movable or projecting objects, slippery surfaces, obstacles you could trip over, and dips or grades along the traveling surface. Additionally, you must contain or control pedestrian traffic in and around the load's travel path. Secure your work area using approved methods, such as rope, sawhorses, warning lights, and tape. You must never lift a load over people. Personnel should stand clear of the suspended load. Tag lines can aid in guiding and controlling the load. When choosing a sling that is going to be used in elevated temperatures, remember that each type of sling has a different temperature limit it can withstand. Web slings and Tuflex round slings must not be used in temperatures that exceed 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Keyflex round slings with their aramid fibers may be used in temperatures up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Wire rope slings with a fiber core must be removed from service if used in temperatures over 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Wire rope slings with a wire rope core must be removed from service when used in temperatures that exceed 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Chain sling capacities must be reduced when used at temperatures of 400 degrees Fahrenheit or more. Permanent capacity reduction begins at 500 degrees Fahrenheit for grade 100 chain and at 600 degrees Fahrenheit for grade 80 chain. Never use chain slings in excess of 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. Wire mesh slings can be used in temperatures up to 550 degrees Fahrenheit. Check for chemical exposure before using slings. Each sling reacts differently to chemicals or chemical environments. Sling strength can radically decrease if used in or even near the wrong chemicals. Check manufacturer's guidelines for chemical compatibility. Loads must be rigged to prevent movement of the sling along a load edge. Tremendous pressure exists at the bearing points where slings contact the load. Should a synthetic sling slide along a load edge while under tension, there is a good chance that the sling will be severed and drop the load. Reduce movement by using sling angles of 60 degrees or greater and by using double wrap choker or basket hitches when practical. Always protect synthetic slings from being cut or damaged by corners, edges, or protrusions. Be sure to use wear pads to help protect the sling and prevent friction or cutting damage to the sling body. These protectors must fully resist the pressure created between a sling and load edges. Steel slings are less easily damaged by cutting and abrasion than synthetic slings, but pads may still be appropriate to protect the sling and or load from damage. There are many pad styles and materials available to accommodate most applications. Sewn on pads for web slings might be appropriate when repetitive lifts wear specific areas of the sling. For more versatile use, sliding sleeves offer protection where needed at the time. Quick sleeve style pads can be easily applied to and positioned on the sling. These pads are appropriate for web slings, round slings, chain and wire rope slings. There are many materials that can be used for wear pads. Some of the more popular are synthetic felt, sling webbing, and leather. If being used for the first time, the ability of a wear pad or other protective device to perform effectively needs to be verified. To accomplish this, raise the load only until it is just barely suspended, then lower the load and inspect the sling and protection materials. If damage is evident, change the type of protector, sling, or hitch and perform the test again. Repeat the process until the sling and protector have not been damaged. 
OSHA regulations for slings are available online at www.osha.gov. Regulation 1910.184. Additional up-to-date guidelines can be found in ASME B30.9. The Web Sling and Tie Down Association standards and the Lift All Catalog website and instruction sheets that accompany each sling. The usable life of a sling can be extended by following proper care and operating procedures. All slings should be stored in a cool, dry area. Web slings should be stored away from direct sunlight. Extensive exposure to ultraviolet light can damage web slings, decreasing their strength. When using slings, never rest loads on top of them and do not drag them on the ground. Do not point load the hook. Make sure the sling, attachment, and load does not snag on anything in your lifting path. Do not twist, kink, or knot slings. Equally important to the proper use of slings is guarding against personal injury. Always keep your hands clear of slings and loads and stand away from suspended loads. Also, never ride the sling or the load. Lift all operating procedures require that you always inspect slings before each use. OSHA states that the sling and all fastening and attachments shall be inspected for damage or defects by a competent person designated by the employer. Damaged or defective slings shall be immediately removed from service. In addition to these requirements, OSHA and ASME specify that chain slings receive a thorough inspection at least once per year and that the employer maintain a record of the most recent inspection. As you recall from the first part of the program, slings can be divided into two basic categories, those made from synthetic materials and those made from steel. There are two varieties of synthetic slings, web slings and round slings. These slings should be removed from service at once when you find cuts, holes, knots, tears, snags, abrasions, damaged fittings, melting or chemical damage, worn or broken stitching, or missing or illegible tags. If any of these problems occur with your synthetic slings, they should be removed from service immediately. An additional indication that a synthetic web sling has been damaged is exposure of the red core yarns. A sling in this condition should be removed from service immediately. Tuflex round slings should be replaced when cover damage is sufficient to expose the load-bearing inner yarns. The three basic types of steel slings are chain, wire mesh, and wire rope. Per OSHA and or ASME instructions, wire rope slings with the following conditions must be removed from service immediately. Kinking, crushing, bird caging, wear, corrosion, damaged sleeves or end fittings, missing or illegible identification, or heat damage. Wire rope slings damaged by heat can be difficult to recognize. A good indication of damage is absence of lubrication or discoloration. Another common cause for wire rope sling rejection is broken wires. Ten broken wires in one rope lay, or five broken wires in one strand in one rope lay, is cause for rejection. Chain slings must be removed from service immediately when they have one of these problems. Wear, nick or gouges, cracks or breaks, elongation, twisted or bent links, weld spatter, lack of component flexibility, missing or illegible identification, unauthorized or makeshift repairs, or excessive heat damage resulting in severe discoloration. 
See Manufacturer's Recommendations for Specific Rejection Criteria. The following conditions on wire mesh slings indicate they must be removed from service immediately. Broken welds or wires. Abrasion. Corrosion or heat damage. Missing or illegible identification. Reduced flexibility or field repairs. The safety inspection must include end fittings and attachments in both the synthetic and steel sling categories. According to OSHA regulations, end fittings and attachments must be replaced when they show any of these problems. Cracks, distortion, or wear. If a hook latch is present, it must be in good working condition or it could prevent the sling from working properly. Slings and their end fittings that do not pass safety inspections should either be destroyed or sent back to the manufacturer for further evaluation and possible repair. Never attempt to do the repairs yourself. Damaged slings and their fittings should never be used in any lifting situation. Web slings, Tuflex round slings, and wire rope slings cannot be repaired. However, undamaged end fittings and attachments can be returned to the manufacturer for possible reuse. Chain and wire mesh slings can be repaired by the manufacturer. We recommend that any reused parts or end fittings be proof tested and certified. If you follow the guidelines in this presentation, not only will your lifts be more effective, but much safer, and the life you save may be your own. Safety in Lifting is a special presentation from LiftAll, brought to you in the interest of worker safety and the efficient handling of materials. Our next video comes to us from Crosby Rigging. One of the basic hitches when using slings is called the choker hitch. The choker hitch is formed when one leg of the sling connects back to itself. A choker hitch does not have the full capacity of the straight leg vertical hitch. The choker hitch capacity is approximately 75% of the straight leg vertical hitch. Choker hitches formed in wire rope slings are stated to be approximately 75% of the single leg hitch. Synthetic slings and chain slings are stated to be 80% of the single leg capacity. This capacity assumes that the angle of choke is at least 120 degrees. Some standards, such as API RP2D offshore environments, require slings of all types when used in a choker hitch application to have a capacity of no more than 70% of the straight leg vertical hitch. The sling's capacity is reduced further if the angle of choke is less than 120 degrees. In fact, if the sling is bent back over itself, with the angle of choke approaching zero degrees, the sling's capacity would be reduced by 50%. A single leg choker hitch is easy and convenient to use and can work well on simple, short loads, but it does not always provide the load control and grip needed for safe and effective rigging. Sometimes multiple leg slings choked on both ends of the load are required to gain the load control necessary. If choker hitches are used the user must always ensure that the slings cannot slip or slide along the load. It is important to note that a standard choker hitch does not provide a full 360 degree contact with the load. A double wrap choker hitch is better for handling those hard to handle loads and bundles of materials like rods or pipe that require more sling contact to hold them in place. Make sure the slings do not overlap at the bottom of the load when you form the double wrap choker. As a final note, the user should always make sure that all slings are protected from edges, corners, 
protrusions or abrasive surfaces in order to protect the sling from any damage. Hardware can be used to form the various choker hitches. The use of hardware simplifies the connection as well as the operation of the slings used in choker hitches. Whether it is grab hooks for chain slings, shackles and sliding choker hooks for wire rope slings, or the webbing sling hook for synthetic choker hitches. In all these cases, the hardware allows the connection and disconnection of the choker hitch without pulling the sling body through an eye or a link. When using chain, a cradle grab hook provides the full rating of the vertical leg capacity. When using wire rope, a screw pin shackle with a pin in the eye offers a simple method of connecting. When using a web sling, the sliding choker hitch prevents bunching and simplifies the connection and disconnection of the sling. And our final video is again from Crosby Rigging. Crosby screw pin and bolt type shackles, sizes 3 16 inch to 3 inch, can be used in side loading applications when installed correctly with the pin secure and the direction of loading is in the plane of the shackle bow, as shown in Crosby's general catalog. However, a reduction in the shackle's working load limit is required when side loading occurs. It is important to point out that side loading of a round pin shackle is never allowed. It is secured by a cotter pin that could shear when side loaded. When the direction of pull is vertical, perpendicular to the shackle pin, no reduction in the shackle's working load limit is required. However, if the shackle is subjected to a side load of 45 degrees from vertical, the shackle's working load limit must be reduced to 70% of the shackle's rated capacity. Thus, when a screw pin or bolt type shackle is subjected to a 45 degree side load, the shackle loses 30% of its published working load limit. If the screw pin or bolt type shackle is subjected to a 90 degree side load from vertical, the adjusted working load limit would be 50% of the shackle's rated capacity. Thus, when a screw pin or bolt type shackle is subjected to a 90 degree side load, the shackle loses 50% of its published working load limit. It is important to state that when a shackle is used as a collector ring to gather multiple sling legs as shown, this is not considered a side loading circumstance. When the slings are collected with the included angle not greater than 120 degrees, this would be considered a balanced load and the shackle's working load limit would not require a reduction. Job site considerations. The handling, setting, and erection of materials and equipment is a hazardous occupation. Each operation presents its own peculiar problems, and no two jobs are alike. With proper consideration taken, each job can be performed free of bodily harm to the employee and without damage to the equipment. The person authorized and qualified to do rigging must always pay close attention to details. One careless moment or act can result in serious injury or death and tremendous property damage. Proper rigging is an art and should never be left to the inexperienced. If you don't know how to do it properly, then don't attempt it, period. Persons performing rigging tasks usually already have two strikes against them when they start. Unfavorable job conditions and job schedule to meet. Very rarely does the average worker on a construction site get the opportunity to actually pick the rigging that they're going to use. It's normally purchased by a supervisor, a company purchasing department, or it's sent out from another project. This in itself can create serious problems. The rigging capacity and the material to be lifted must match. Using too small capacity rigging or components is just asking for an accident to happen. So now that we got all that out of the way, now we can actually start looking at the rigging. Who is responsible for that rigging? Obviously that competent and qualified person. Now we're going to get communications established. How is the rigger going to communicate with the equipment operator? Is the equipment in acceptable condition? Appropriate type, proper identification, properly inspected. Are the working load limits adequate? What is the weight of the load? Where's the center of gravity? What is the sling angle? Will there be a side loading? Remember we talked about that in that other video. Capacity of the gear. Will the load be under control? Do you need to put a tagline up on there? Is there any possibility of fouling? And is the area clear of personnel? Not just your company, but everybody else.
Are there any unusual loading or environmental conditions like wind, temperature, surfaces? Yes. Is it really hot? Is it cold? Are we going to have water or ice on the ground? Any unstable objects in this lift? This is your one warning here and forever for the rest of your life. Understand rigging can fail if damaged, misused, or overloaded. So always inspect it before you use it every single time. Use it only if you're trained. Observe the rated capacities. Death or injury can occur from improper use or maintenance. Check everything. It is your job. Your job. If you're the one installing that rigging, it is your job. The load is the actual load. The hitch, anytime you hear the term hitch, that is everything from the load to the hook. And the lifting device is from the hook up. Utilize appropriate rigging gear suitable for overhead lifting, meaning don't just grab any random crap and call it lifting gear. Utilize the rigging gear within industry standards and the manufacturer's recommendations. That is a big one. And conduct regular inspection and maintenance of the rigging gear. Whenever any sling is used, the following practices shall be observed. Slings that are damaged or defective shall not be used. Slings shall not be shortened with knots or bolts. Do not tie a knot in it to make it shorter or other makeshift devices. Sling legs shall not be kinked. Slings shall not be loaded in excess of their rated capacity. Slings used in basket hitch shall have the load balance to prevent slippage and slings shall be securely attached to the load. Slings shall be padded or protected from the sharp edges of their loads. Suspended loads shall be kept free of obstruction and all employees shall be kept clear of loads about to be lifted and of suspended loads. Do not ever fly a load over somebody's head, ever. Hands or fingers shall not be placed between the sling and its load while the sling is being tightened around the load. Shock loading is prohibited. Um, shock loading is where you either push something off onto a sling or you come up real hard. Either way, that's shock loading. Shock loading is prohibited. A sling shall not be pulled from under a load while the load is still resting on the sling. This is a good page for everyone to take a picture of. Each day before being used, the sling and all fastening and attachments shall be inspected for damage and defects by a competent person designated by the employer. Additional inspections shall be performed during sling use as often as necessary to assure the safety of operation. Now, what I tell my people is, when you go to the bathroom and you come back, check the slings again. When you go to lunch and you come back, check the slings again. When you turn your head for 10 minutes, check the slings again. This is literally 100% on the rigor. Check the slings again. Replacement. When there's several localized abrasions or scraping, 10 randomly distributed broken wires in one rope lay, or five broken wires in one rope strand in one rope lay. And I'll, I'll, I'll lay this one out better in another picture, but remember it's 10 in a big or five in a small evidence of heat damage, i.e. being cut with a torch, kinking, crushing, bird caging, or any damage resulting in distortion of the rope structure, damage distorted or field welded hooks. No, you cannot just make your own hooks and you dang sure can't repair them. Damaged or worn ends in the end, if in doubt, don't use it. Now here are some definitions that some of your manufacturer's recommendations are going to use and I want to make sure you know what they mean. Balanced. Load equally distributed on each side of the point of support. Breaking strength. That is the approximate point when under maximum load, the load handling device fails. That's the breaking strength. Balanced. Load equally distributed on each side of the point of support. Bridal sling, a sling composed of multiple legs gathered in a fitting that goes over the lifting hook. Competent person, selected or assigned by the employer as being qualified to perform a specific job. Factor of safety, that is the ratio of breaking strength to the force applied to everything involved. This is not just the hook that's hanging off the crane. It's also the slings, the shackles, including the sides of whatever you're trying to pick up. It's everything. This is a hitch basket loading with the sling passed under the load and both ends on the hook or a single master link. This is a choker loading the sling passed through one eye and suspended by the other. This is vertical loading with the load suspended vertically on a single part or leg of the sling.
Master link, a steel link or ring used to support all the legs of a chain or a wire slope sling. I'll show you some of those later. Mousing, that is lashing between the neck and the tip of the hook to prevent the load from coming off. Rated capacity is the maximum allowable working load and that's gonna be our target to stay underneath depending on what angle. Remember how we talked about it being an art form? This is where we get into what is the way to pick this thing up and not exceed the rated capacity at that angle. Rigging, the connection of a load to a source of power so that it can be lifted and moved safely and predictably. I call it everything under the hook. Safe working load is the maximum allowable working load established by the manufacturer and sheave is a wheel with a groove circumference over which a rope is bent. Wire rope, now this is a bad picture. Again, I'll show you one later on, but this does kind of get you that whole strand versus an actual wire, 10 of these, five of these. This is where you can take the previous one we talked about and apply it here. Wire rope consists of many individual wires laid into a number of strands, which are in turn laid around the center core. Safety factors. To guard against failure of a wire rope in service, the actual load on the rope should only be a fraction of the breaking strength. The safety factor includes reduced capacity of the rope below its stated breaking strength due to wear, fatigue, corrosion, abuse, and variations in size and quality. And I'm gonna throw two more on there. I'm gonna throw on there rust and how old is the dadgum thing? How long has it been sitting in the back of your truck? All these things added together and we should be well below that safe working load and adjust it in your mind. You need, yes, as the rigger, this is where we get into that art form. You need to mentally adjust it because this thing is old, because it has got some rust on it. Or take it out of service. If there's, when in doubt, take it out of service. There are all kinds of slings out there on the market right now. I can't name everyone or even show you examples of everyone because they're always coming out with new ones. These are some examples of slings. The very first thing when you are doing an inspection on any of this gear is look for that inspection tag. You need to check the load testing. How often has it been? When's the last time it got load tested? Check the manufacturer and see how often it wants it load tested. And then see this chain right here? There's only one kind of chain that's allowed to be used in lifting operations and that is chain that's rated for lifting and you're going to know it because it's going to have some a stamp right here along the lines it's not going to be some regular home depot chain it's going to have a stamp with it that gives it puts it on the rating system wire rope remember we were talking about the single strand versus the rope lay regular lay all that stuff this is again another picture of the tiny little fibers that wrap around to make a rope and then a bunch of ropes that wrap up Again, go back and look at the 10 per and 5 per, and you'll know what, exactly what's going on here. And here's a chart to show you that sometimes you have really thick cable, and then sometimes you have really thin cable. The thick cable, it's abrasion resistance. Increased with larger wires, but it decreases with the smaller wires. The smaller wires, they're fatigue resistant. There are benefits to each one. One is better at abrasion, the other is better at fatigue, meaning you can bend it around a lot better. We're gonna to retouch on sling capacity versus the angle. For example, a sling capable of lifting 1,000 pounds in a 30 degree vertical basket hitch can only lift 866 pounds at a 30 degree angle, 707 pounds at a 45 degree angle, and 500 pounds at a 60 degree angle. Understand the angle dramatically adjusts the safe working load. You must be familiar with the sling. I do not know what sling you're working with, so I cannot give you the proper load chart for it, but this is an example of one that you can find online. As you can see, you've got the rope size, then the eye size, recommended minimum length, straight pull, choker, vertical, and then again, we got those angles. As the rigger, this is your responsibility to know this on the slings that you are using. And here's another example chart. So up here at a 90 degree angle, you're about 87% capacity. Whereas if you're picking it from a 30 degree angle, you've dropped the capacity to almost 50%. There are all kinds of wire rope slings. I cannot give you training on every one of them because I just don't know what you're dealing with. Check the manufacturer's recommendations. That is always the go-to place for how to use that sling. This is an example of what bird caging looks like. If you see this on the sling, pull it out of service. And this is what kinking looks like. See how it's not straight anymore and it starts having that kink? Here's a picture of it much worse. No kinking. Now we move on to synthetic slings. Sling capacity varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. No set standard like wire rope has. User must look at the individual sling capacity tag. Again, first thing we inspect is the tag. 
to determine the safe lifting capacity of that sling. If the tag is not readable or it is missing, do not use it. Inspect the sling before each day's use and as often as necessary during the day to assure the safety of the sling. Sharp edges can slice it in two without warning as the load is tensioned. Use softeners or padding on corners. And finally, we're coming back to chain slings. Only grade eight or better alloy chain can be used for overhead lifting purposes. All chain is not rated the same. Remember, Home Depot chain ain't no good. Chain must have a capacity tag attached to it. Chains will withstand more rough handling and abuse, but a chain with the same rated lifting capacity of wire rope will be much larger in diameter and way heavier. Chains must be inspected daily before use and as often as necessary during the use to assure safety. It is the rigger's responsibility to do the inspections. And these are some examples of chain sling assemblies that you could purchase. Again, check manufacturer's recommendations for exactly how to use them and the safe working loads. These are some examples of softening, padding, or even using blocks, using an extension. There are different ways to rig stuff up. Again, this really is an art form. Rigging components are expensive to buy and to replace. Use them properly and store them properly. Keep wire rope slings lubricated and all rigging stored out of the weather, not in the bed of your truck. Treat rigging as though your life depends on it because it does if it fails. Don't use makeshift rigging or attempt to repair any rigging components. Knots tied in rigging reduce the strength by 50% or more and can lead to permanent damage to the rigging. Now, just as a little practical application, what would you need to lift this up? First, where would you pick it up? Where's the pickup point? Yep, you see the shackles up there, but don't just hook onto it. You need to check the manufacturer of this turbo jet and make sure that those are lifting eyes because just because they look like it doesn't mean that they are. You could pick this thing up, get 100 feet up in the air, and boom, it comes down. Check the manufacturer, make sure it's good to go. Then, okay, now we need to hook into it. Okay, now we need a crane to pick it up. You literally start with the load and work your way up, checking every single thing until you get to that hook. What about this? This is a forklift that's been turned over on its side. Where would you pick this up? How would you hook up to it? These are the things that as a, a rigger in the field, you need to know not just the capabilities of your equipment, but also the load. Anyone who's driven a forklift, you know that that butt back there, that forklift butt is real heavy. That's where all the weight's going to be. So you need to do something to pick up the main load right here, but you also need to make sure that you're not going to put the forks in the dirt. So you're going to also have to have something coming off to the side. Main load here and something to the side over here. What about this? How would you pick that up? Now, any logical person would say right there on those lifting eyes. Okay, well, does it matter if it's full or if it's empty? So it's not just what you can see, it's also what you can't see. You gotta think about what you're doing. All right, test time. What's wrong with this picture? That's right, this is improperly loaded. I've got my keeper being depressed in and I've also got side loading happening here. And what's wrong with this picture? Right over here, this is definitely not Lifting equipment. This is a welder's C-clamp. Absolutely not. Lifting equipment is lifting equipment. And it's only lifting equipment. And what's wrong with this picture? This one, we have two issues. One, we have no keeper. Two, this has definitely been extended out from picking something up way too big. This goes in the trash. And what's wrong with this picture? This one's got three issues. One, I'm side loading. Two, I'm side loading on the keeper. And then three, is that thing even screwed down tight enough? These are all things you need to deal with as the rigger. And what's wrong with this picture? We never, ever, ever hang things off of forks. Never. That is not rated for weight to be put right there. That is not acceptable as a rigger. If you need to hang something off the forks, either A, your forklift, there are forklifts that have hooks hanging down there, or B, you can get a jib. It is an external unit. You slide onto the forks and you're good to go. This is unacceptable ever. There's nobody in the government, OSHA, or any safety organization that's going to sign off on this that's worth their weight. Stop doing this. And what's wrong with this picture? Obviously, 
Right here, we're missing our keeper. You can tell from this picture there's no keeper. Two, that chain, I don't see any kind of a tag hanging off that thing. I'd be willing to bet that's just whatever chain they had sitting around. And then clearly, we are right next to a power line. Are we staying 10 plus feet away from that power line? And what's wrong with this picture? Pretty simple. If it's a cotter pin, it goes all the way in. That cotter pin has worked itself out. You need to grab your clines, drag it in, and then roll it around. And what's wrong with this picture? We never put our hands between the rigging and the load, ever. And what's wrong with this picture? Obviously, the first issue is, are, are you an idiot? Get off of this piece of equipment. Issue number two, we never have our hands on the load when we're picking it up. The problem is, especially with something big or heavy or bulky, when you pick it up, well, which way is it going to go? Is it going to go this way or this way? You have no clue. And then you have nowhere to run if that thing starts swinging towards you. We never, ever put our hands on the load. If you need, get a tagline. This is what a tagline looks like. But we never put ourselves in this crazy position, always have an escape route. If something goes wrong, look behind you. Where are you going to run? This guy would just get knocked off the pedestal. And what's wrong with this picture? First, it looks like excessive rust. Two, I've got cable hanging out over here, and it looks like I may have some strands coming out over here as well. And then, of course, we're side-loading to the point that it's it looks like it's close to popping up over that latch. Uh-uh. And what's wrong with this picture? Here we go, side-loading again. The very easy solution to this is get a shackle. Very simple, get a shackle. And what's wrong with this picture? The first thing we need to pay attention to is not damaging the product. This dude is going to kill this animal trying to save it. The next thing is, anytime you heard me talk about rope, I was talking about wire rope. I never talked about this kind of rope because this is not for lifting and construction. If you want to use this kind of rope, you need to quit construction. We do not use this kind of rope for lifting in construction, period. Now I'm giving you a gore warning. The next picture you're about to see is a little bit graphic. So if you've got a weak stomach or gore bothers you, you need to just close your eyes for a minute. Now this picture here is from the oil field, but this is why we never, ever, ever have jewelry on while we're handling rigging. Take off your jewelry when you're handling rigging and always wear gloves. Hand signs, the hand signs between the rigger and the crane operator or forklift operator. See, I, let's throw out this sign right here. Well, see, in skiing, this sign means that the speed's okay. But offshore, this sign means go slow. The problem is I could throw you all kinds of hand signs out and you're not going to remember them. The solution is it doesn't matter what hand signs you use so long as before you do the operation, you, as the rigger, go talk to that operator and say, when I do this, it means this. When I point my finger up, it means go up. When I point it down, it means this. When I give you this, it means that. You talk to the operator every single time. And if you come back the next day, he may have had somebody else that was giving him other hand signs. Talk to him again. It's all about communication. Talk to the competent person for your company on your job site in regards to rigging if you have any questions with this. Also, don't forget to consult your safety manual, your company safety manual. Don't ever forget about the manufacturer's recommendations. And then also, we haven't even talked about any of the federal or local laws that may apply to your region. I do not know them all. I don't know what gear you're working with. So make sure that you are in line with everybody. And here's a video that can show you what will happen if you don't do everything you're supposed to do as a rigger. I hope this video finds you well and I'll catch you in the next one.